So let, let's resume. We're very happy to have uh, James Gray and Lara Anderson for uh, a series of lectures on uh, heterotic geometry and low energy effective actions, both from Virginia Tech. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, we're looking forward to your lectures. Thanks. Thank you. Is this working? Everyone hear me? Um, so I'm James. Normally I'd uh, point out Lara, who would normally be in the audience when we do these kinds of joint talks, but she's literally got left holding the baby. Um, so you'll meet her on Thursday. So the way we're going to do this is I'll do the first talk, then Lara will do two, and then I'll do the last one. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to say something a, a little bit about questions. So, you know, there's a lot has been said about how you should ask questions, and we all know that, right? Um, Two things. First of all, I don't tend to stop for questions in talks because I'm just going to assume you're going to shout out when you've got them. You don't want to wait 10 minutes and be completely lost. So just shout out when you've got your questions. I'm not going to stop. Actually, the real reason I don't stop is I always forget to do it. So just shout out your questions. The other thing to say is if you have a well formulated question, that's fantastic. Just shout it out anytime or ask in the discussion sessions. But one of the best things about schools is when you have the question that's not quite sharp enough to do that. And in those cases, if you feel like you're not comfortable doing that, do come and find us at other times. And you can ask any question about, the, this, uh, from me, about to either me or Lara. So, for example, one perfectly acceptable question is, uh, yeah, so your last lecture, what was all that about then? Right. If you just get completely lost, just come and say. Um, because, you know, if you try to get yourself unstuck by reading, that's a huge investment of time. And the advantage of a summer school is you can bypass that by talking to someone. The other type of question that tends to crop up is the sort of disturbance in the force question. There was an area of the lecture where you know there's something fishy going on, but you don't quite know what it is, right? You know something's not quite right, but you kind of want to just come and chat to us about it, and we can, uh, we can try and help out. Um, the annoying thing about that, especially the last of those two, the disturbance in the force kind of question, is what tends to happen is you realize what the question was after you've left. So if that happens, um, please feel free to give us an email, and we'll try and help you out. So this is my email, um, no dot in between my names. And Lara's email is very similar, but she does use a dot. So if, you have, if something comes to you after we've finished, uh, then please feel free to send us an email. None of us bite. Actually, the baby does bite, but he doesn't have any teeth, so it's all cool. OK, so what are we going to be talking about? Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, compactifications of the heterotic string to give n equals 1 theories in four dimensions. Um, I'm not going to give a huge amount of motivation for this because most people know why we may be interested in that. For example, you may want to ask, could the universe we live in actually be a compactification of a string theory? And if you do that, you're going to need some kind of symmetry to protect the Higgs mass from going to a large scale, and supersymmetry is kind of how we do that in these kinds of constructions. So it's a way of trying to get some kind of realistic physics from a string compactification, although, of course, we're a very, very long way from that, and we'll see exactly how far as we go along. There are other reasons why you may want to study heterotic string theory, even if you're interested in a different type of compactification of string theory. And that's just basically based around the fact that the heterotic string compactifications are often the best understood. So for example, if you're interested in F theory and you want to look at I don't know, super potentials in F theory, then you may want to study super potentials in the heterotic string where the computations are easier and then use heterotic F theory duality to map across and see what you can learn about the F theory case. So there's many reasons to learn about these compactifications. Um, and we're just going to dive in and see how we do, see what we can learn. So how are the four lectures going to be split up? Well, I'm going to start today with a, a very schematic overview of the types of geometry that appear in this kind of subject. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute what we're going to do today. Once I've done the overview, Lara's going to step in, and she's going to talk about the case of Club Yau compactifications and polystable bundles over them. She's going to talk about uh, what's known in the mathematics, the geometry of those objects, and how that relates to various phenomena in the effective theory, the 4D effective Lagrangians that you get out. So we'll do that for two lectures. And then at the end, I'll come back, and we'll do some slightly more sort of esoteric topics, for example, um, tangents to moduli spaces of non-Kähler compactifications, maybe modern constructions of Club Yau's that Lara hasn't mentioned, and so on and so forth. So that's the plan. But today we're going to start um, with a, a somewhat schematic lecture, um, just on a sort of overview of the types of geometry that appear 
in uh, smooth geometric compactifications of the heterotic string. And the reason uh, I'm going to do this is, is twofold. Firstly, this sort of overview of why people are studying these different kinds of compactifications is the thing that it's hard to get from any one paper or textbook. Textbooks, generally speaking, aren't modern enough. And the papers, of course, are only going to be looking at the construction they're interested in. So getting this overview of how it all fits together tends to be the hard thing to get a handle on. So we're going to just start with that overview. The other reason for that is you're going to see that after this lecture today, often we're going to just specialize to the case of bundles over Kala Biao. And when you look at them, they're so nice, you can do so much with them. It, it, you have a tendency to believe that all that exists in life is Kala Biao's with bundles over them. Uh, and it's important to remember what a special case that actually is and how restrictive you're being in accessing certain computational tools. I should say, because this is somewhat an overview of how things fit together today, I'll have a fair number of references in the talk of telling you where you can look up more of what I'm talking about. I should say my references are certainly not complete. Um, so I've deliberately not come up with a complete reference set. Instead, what I've come up with as we go through is the particular types of paper that I found useful in getting into a subject. So some, these are the papers that had an explanation that I personally found particularly nice and helped me get into the subject. So it would, if you're interested in learning more, hopefully these are sort of accessible entry points. Cool. That was my speed. How are we doing? OK. So let's get started. Um, and I'm going to start by uh, saying which theory we're going to be discussing. Um, and I'm going to write up an action. We're actually not going to use the action, but seeing as we've got one, I feel like I should really write it up. So, we, so we've got it up on the board. So we're going to be studying heterotic string theory. Um, and in particular, I'm going to stick to the EA E8 heterotic string. Uh, so we just have a 10D theory with 16 supercharges. Uh, which is essentially just 10-dimensional uh, sugra, 10-dimensional supergravity, coupled to two copies of E8 super Yang mills with a a gauge field and, and, and gauginos and nothing else. So one thing to mention here is, particularly in a phenomenological context, as phenomenological as this subject gets, you often see people not talking about the 10D string theory here, but they would talk about something that Yuji mentioned, which is heterotic M theory. There's an 11-dimensional theory describing the strongly coupled limit of the E8 heterotic string that is often used in this context instead of the 10D theory. I'm going to stick to the 10D theory because of a nice fact, which is that um, the 11D theory um, is essentially um, some six-dimensional compact manifold, a line interval, and then four-dimensional space. If you do the dimensional reduction of the 11D theory down to 10 dimensions, just on the line interval, you get an identical 10-dimensional action to the one we're going to start with. There is no difference. So, 11D theory gives rise to the same 10D effective theory that we're going to start with. Um, and so anything I say actually also applies to heterotic M theory. So the proof of that, that these two are the same, was um, done in some of the original Lucas Over at Waldron papers. So you can find it here. My writing will deteriorate as time goes by, so call me on it when it gets too bad. It's 9801087. Um, the only difference between the two cases, so the 10D actions are the same, the only difference between the two cases, the strongly coupled theory and the weakly coupled theory, is regimes of validity. If you look in the moduli space where you're allowed to use the Lagrangian, it's ever so slightly different, as you might expect. So the regimes, oh, these boards are going to... I used to have to use these types of boards with the, the squeegee and up and down when I was teaching in Munich, and I've still got PTSD. So. OK, there we go. So these have slightly different re re uh, regimes of uh, validity. Um, expansion parameters, if you like, which have to be small. 
And if you want to read about those expansion parameters in detail and how they're related, you can read about that in another one of the early Lukasov or Waldron papers, 101. And you just need section 2.1 if you want to look at the expansion parameters. So that was a long way of saying that we just need to look at the 10D action, and that's what we're going to focus on. I'm going to keep dropping that page, so I'm just going to leave it. OK. So what's the action of what we're looking at? Of course, now it's too high. So the action um, is just going to be a standard gravitational action. So the conventions I'm using here are very close to the ones that you'll find in Jean Green, Schwartz, and Widden, for example. We're going to have gravity. We'll have a dilaton. Uh, we'll have the Neverschwartz three-form field strength, which is coupled to the dilaton in a specific way. And then there's some additional terms at higher derivatives. There's a, well, sorry, one of them's at higher derivative. There's trace F squared. There's the, the gauge field strength of the E8 times the E8 gauge fields. And then there's a higher derivative term, which is important to include, trace R squared. So this is um, the curvature two form, uh, squared and take the trace. And then, of course, there's plus fermions that no one ever writes down. And I'm not going to break the tradition. This action is not all that you need in this theory. It doesn't encompass all of the equations of motion in the theory. In particular, you also need a Bianchi identity to define things. And the Bianchi identity, in the simplest case in 10 dimensions, will just be that dh is not 0, but rather it is, in some conventions, trace r wedge r minus trace f wedge f. So there's a, a diffuse magnetic charge a spread out magnetic charge for the Nivea-Schwarz uh, field strength coming from both the curvature of space-time and the field strength of the gauge fields. Okay. No, in particular, that means that um, H is not equal to dB, even locally. So even locally on a patch on the manifold, it is not true that H is dB. So that's the action. As I said, we'll kind of rarely use it. What we really are going to use a lot, especially today, is the supersymmetry transformations that go along with that. Um, and so what we're going to do today is write down the supersymmetry transformations and then consider vacua of that theory that compactify down to four dimensions that give rise to preserve four supercharges that gives rise to a 4D theory with a certain amount of supersymmetry. Um, and we'll see what array of beasts we can get by considering that. So this action, particularly if I'd include the fermion terms, is invariant under a set of transformations. For the usual reasons, you only ever write down the fermionic transformations. That's because the bosonic transformations are proportional to fermions, and all the fermions are zero in vacuum. So if you're considering vacuum equations, you don't need to consider fermion variations, just bo uh, boson variations, just fermion ones. Um, and these variations have a, a somewhat complicated form. So there's a gauge covariant, oh, there's a covariant derivative on our supersymmetry parameter. So this is going to be a 16 component supersymmetry parameter, eta. And then we have, I'll explain my notation in a second. And again, there would be, for example, in all of these relations, there'd be something like fermion squared terms, which can actually be important, but I'm not going to write them down. We're not going to hit them today. For, so that's the gravitino variation. The gauge, you know, the partner of the gauge field, we have something much simpler. This A index here is just going to be a gauge index in the adjoint of E8 times E8. And then we have the Dilatino. OK. NP. OK, good. So here, as I said, this eta is our 16 component uh, supersymmetry parameter. 
And all of these gammas here are just anti-symmetric products of gamma matrices as usual. So this would be 1 over 3 factorial, gamma m, gamma n, gamma p, and so on and so forth. Okay. So what we want to do is look at the solutions to this um, that preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry in four dimensions. So how are we going to do that? So what we want here is some 10-dimensional solution to the theory that's essentially um, a direct product of a four-dimensional piece and a six-dimensional piece. We could include a warped product of those two, and when it's relevant, I will do in the background, but I'm just going to be a bit schematic here. Um, and what we want to do is look at how this spinner parameter breaks up as the Lorentz group in 10 dimensions breaks up under the four and six dimensional pieces. So the Lorentz group has a subgroup that will be relevant for us. It looks like this. So 10 dimensional transformations look like four dimensional and six dimensional, or the uh, subgroup of them looks like that. And if you look at this 16 component spinner parameter that transforms under the 10 dimensional Lorentz group, you can ask how it transforms under the six dimensional and the four dimensional pieces. So that's just a question in group theory of taking the 16 dimensional representation of this Lorentz group and branching it down. And if you ask how this transforms, it transforms like this. So all we have is these 16 components transform in this way. So they transform as vial spinners of two different types under SO1, 3, and they transform in the spinner representation of SO6. So the, um, the spinner of SO6 looks like the fundamental of SU4, so it looks like a, a four-dimensional spinner in this way. So in sorry, particular, sorry. if you compact... Sorry, could you perhaps write a, a bit bigger? Yeah, thank, thank you, you for telling sorry. me. Certainly will. So you start with 16 parameters here. Um, and uh, if you compactified the theory to keep all of those parameters, then you're going to end up with four copies of uh, four sets of supercharges in four dimensions. So one two and one two prime, so one vial and one antivial spinner, would give you one supersymmetry, n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions. And if you keep all of the supercharges that descend from this 16, you're going to get four such spinners and you get an n equals four theory in four dimensions. So what we want to do is with this breakup, you can write, again, schematically, uh, the breakup of the spinner like this. So I have 4D spinners, epsilon, and 60 internal spinners, nu. And we don't want there to be, say, four solutions to these equations. So we're going to set these to zero to preserve supersymmetry. And we don't want there to be four solutions to these equations um, for the news, because that will lead to four sets of supersymmetries preserved in, um, in four dimensions. So what we're going to be looking for is we want... So we want a solution to Ah, thank you. I've got the memory of a goldfish, so please do keep reminding me. So we want a solution to all of these killing spinner equations. We want a certain supersymmetry to be preserved. We want the vacuum to be invariant under a supersymmetry transformation. And we want that to be of the form where there's just one internal spinner that does that. So of the four internal spinners that you could have in this decomposition, if you like, I only want one of them to give rise to a solution to these equations. And then what will happen is, under the supersymmetry variations, only a quarter of the supersymmetry will leave the vacuum I'm looking at alone. And just like in the Higgs effect, the symmetry that's left after Higgsing is the one that leaves the web of the Higgs field alone. 
the symmetry that will be left, the supersymmetry that will be left here, if I solve these equations, if I have these symmetry variations being vanishing for just a quarter of the supersymmetries, I'll just be left with a quarter, four supercharges, which will be n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions. Now, when I do this, um, I immediately find that there's a, a certain type of geometry that I'm interested in, and it's not Calabi-L, which is what people normally say. So, in particular, if I look at this first supersymmetry variation, which is probably too small, so let me, oops, let me write something else up. If I look at this first supersymmetry variation, and I plug in an ansatz like this for the spinner, and I just look at the internal components of that supersymmetry variation. So I just look at the internal components. So my I index here will run over the six internal dimensions. The MNP over here ran over 10 dimensions. And if I just consider H fluxes that only live in the hidden space, so I don't, you know, it's a form with three indices. So if I have H having legs in external four dimensions, I'll break uh, Poincare invariance. So let me just, for simplicity, say H is only going to live in the internal dimensions then what I want is a solution to the killing spinner equations that looks like this. So same thing, but replace new with the one spinner that you want to be a solution, so you only get one set of supersymmetry preserved. And I want that to be equal to zero. Thing to notice, what this is saying, so this is linear in the spinner here, the internal spinner. So what this is saying is that um, there is some derivative operator. Uh, let me call it d prime, acting on u that gives zero. And in particular, that that means that this new naught, the solution we're interested in, um, is a nowhere vanishing spinner on the internal dimensions. Essentially, this is a linear differential equation for new naught. So if it was zero somewhere, it would be zero everywhere. So we want um, to preserve n equals one supersymmetry. And what that tells us, in fact, is that there will be some spinner that doesn't vanish anywhere on the manifold. And that already tells us a little bit about the kind of geometry we're after. So in particular, if you consider patching the geometry together, so you're building your manifold, you've got your coordinate patches, and you're going to join your coordinate patches together to make some global structure. Here are two coordinate patches. And let's consider what this spinner that's the solution to this equation looks like. So if I have that spinner, it's going to be some four-component object in general. So it would be some four-component vector. But I could do an SU4 transformation on any given patch. Say I'm on this patch. I can just do an SU4 transformation, a local Lorentz transformation, if you like, to put it in the form nu naught prime some number, 0, 0, 0. Okay. And I could do the same over here. So on this patch, I could do the same thing using the local SU4 on this patch, I can just put the spinner in this form. This is just looking at a, a solution to this equation, but this equation tells me I want a spinner that's nowhere zero. So in particular, I'm going to have this form on this patch, this form on this patch. This is not zero anywhere, and neither is this. And on the overlap, this has to all glue together nicely. So I'm going to get a nice global solution. And what that means is the transition functions can no longer be general. So in general, the transition functions would be a general SU4 transformation acting on these four-component spinners. If you like, it's a, a general transformation on the spinner of SO6. But if I'm going to have such a spinner present, it's clear I can't have a general transformation because it's not going to match that to that in a well-defined way. What I'm going to need is my 4 by 4 transformation is going to have to have this form so that it leaves this alone and glues it together correctly. 
So if I want a globally defined nowhere vanishing spinner, which is the condition to get n equals 1 supersymmetry in 4D, I need that the transition functions defining the manifold live within a subgroup of what you would naively expect. They're not SU4 valued, they're valued in SU3. What that means is the manifold we're interested in admits um, a reduced structure or a G structure. So, in particular, what this means is we are interested. in a manifold of SU3 structure. Which just means that. The transition functions are reduced in, in nature. Now, so far, everything's been in terms of forms and no uh, spinners, and no one likes working with spinners. Actually, that's not true. Some people do, but I don't like working with spinners. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take this formalism and swap it out for a different one where instead of the object that's telling us about the SU3 structure here being this spinner, we're going to swap it out for a couple of forms, just bosonic forms that we can work with instead, just because it's easier. So in particular, um, we want to describe... this SU3 structure with forms, not spinners. Um, and I'm going to use this. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about how this works. I'm going to show you a bit, but I'm not going to go into the, the nuts and bolts of it, um, because I'm just going to use it as an organizing principle to tell you about the types of, of compactification that people have been looking at. But if you want to read more about uh, describing these SU3 structures in terms of forms, I really recommend this paper by Dan Wilderman and collaborators. It's in the context of type 2, this paper, but the geometry they're describing just is, is works in general. They have lots of nice appendices taking you through all of the SU3 structure stuff, but in physicist terms. You can also read original papers on SU3 structure by Salomon and so on and so, and so forth, but this is just sort of easier to access if you're a physicist. OK, so how are we going to turn this um, spinner that we have here, this nowhere vanishing spinner that defined an SU3 structure, into forms where we're just going to use fermion bilinears? So we can define one two form on the six dimensional space just by sandwiching appropriate versions of the spinner between an anti symmetric product of gamma matrices other way around, sandwich the gamma matrices between the spinners. And you can also define a, a complex three form. Well, you can define a, a complex three form in the same way. Have I gone down to small writing again, or are we still cool? OK. OK. So we're going to work with this spinner, these forms, j and omega, instead of the spinners. And in fact, um, they effectively contain the same information um, as the spinner and will allow us to proceed a bit more easily. So now we've got there, we can ignore all this and just think about J and omega. So J and omega are going to have two types of property, two types of constraint on them. So first thing to say is because they're built out of a nowhere vanishing spinner, these are nowhere vanishing forms on this SU3 structure. And they're going to have two types of property. One is going to be an algebraic property, an algebraic constraint on the forms, an equation that they have to obey. And the other is going to be a differential property. So these, the differentials of these forms are going to have certain properties. The way this is going to work is the algebraic constraint on these forms is just going to be something that's necessary to have an SU3 structure in the first place. In other words, in terms of our heterotic theory, this is going to be the constraint on the forms that's necessary for the, the, the compactification to give you an n equals 1 theory. The differential constraints on the SU3 structure are going to come from solving these differential equations, 
And depending on what we ask of these equations, depending on the type of solution we look for, we'll get different differential constraints on j and omega. And that's going to tell us the type of SU3 structure we have. So the fact that we have an SU3 structure, the algebraic constraints, will tell us we have an n equals 1 theory. The type of SU3 structure we get will tell us what type of theory we get on dimensional reduction. So let's go through that and see how it works. So we're going to have two types of constraints, algebraic and uh, differential. Let's start with the algebraic. The algebraic constraint is very simple. It just says that j wedge omega equals 0. Incidentally, notice I haven't said the words, well, I probably did by accident, but I shouldn't have said the words complex yet. These are not complex indices. This is a two-form. This is a three-form. I haven't introduced complex indices on the manifold yet or anything like that. Okay. Nevertheless, there's a constraint that says that j wedge omega is 0. And there's two ways to drive that. There's the extremely painful way, and then there's the smart way. So the extreme, extremely painful way is you can prove this from the definition of the forms in terms of spinners using Fitz identities. Identities. So if you just take the definition of j and omega I had and you wedge together the forms and then you use some Fitz identities, it is possible uh, to find that that's true. You don't want to really do that unless you're used to, to dealing with spinners and have done it a lot because it's a bit of a pain. And if you read that um, reference I gave you on these SU3 structures in more gener generality, you'll see that this kind of um, proof can become a lot simpler. So let me just sketch a quicker way for proving this to show you the type of thing that reading that paper would buy you. So there's a, a quick way to argue this if you know a little bit more about these SU3 structures. So J and omega are invariant under the structure group, under the SU3 structure. Essentially because they were built out of invariant spinners. Okay. That means that J wedge omega is also going to be invariant, and that's going to be an invariant five form. So five forms transform in the six representation of SO6. So a five form transforms as the six of SO6. That's essentially just because to define a five form component, you just have to say which index you're leaving out. There's six choices. And it's then going to transform under the structure group as a six dimensional representation. And you can just ask, OK, if I have the six-dimensional representation of SO6, how does that transform? How does that transform under the SU3 subgroup? How would that transform if my structure group was actually reduced? And the way it transforms is as a 3 plus 3 bar representation. There's no singlet. What that means is there's no such thing as an invariant five form under the SU3 structure. It just simply doesn't exist. So the only way a five form can be invariant is if it's zero. Trust me, if you haven't used Fitz identities very much, trust me, saying going through those few lines is actually a lot simpler. Yeah, I see a few people nodding out there. Yeah. People with supervisors have inflicted pain. Good to see. Yeah. Um, it's a lot simpler to do this type of thing. And that's why, even though, because I'm just going to use it as a classifying principle here, I'm not going into the details of how these SU3 structures we, uh, work. It's well worth having a read of that, that reference I gave you. OK, so this is the algebraic constraint. If you have that constraint, then you're going to have an SU3 structure. So if you have a nowhere vanishing j and omega, however you get them, you can get them from the spinner bilinear, or you can guess and see them 
However, you get your nowhere vanishing j and omega, two form and three form. If they obey that constraint, you've got an SU3 structure. And the type of SU3 structure you get is then going to depend on the differential constraints on j and omega. So let's move on to those. OK, so that's the algebraic constraints. Let's look at differential. So without loss of generality, we can write expressions for both dj and d omega and see what we get. I'm going to Sorry. write it. Uh, just yeah. a quick question. Uh, there is also this identity relating j cubed and omega and uh, its complex. Very object. good. In fact, I would is probably it should have mentioned it's not actually an identity. It's a choice. But I should have mentioned that. Thank you for calling me. Good. So this is the actual only constraint. but. This is a very fine point to, to mention. There's actually a choice of normalization you can make as well, which is we also make the choice to set j wedge j wedge j equal to minus 3 over 4i. I'm writing too small again. j wedge j wedge j. I can set equal to minus 3 over 4i omega bar wedge omega. Why can I make that choice? Both of these are six forms. They're top forms on the space. Uh, so they're proportional to each other. Um, and I can just choose the constant of proportionality to be minus 3 over 4i um, just by scaling one of the forms. Remember, the, whole, the only constraint on j and omega is there a nowhere vanishing form. As long as I can multiply them by any nowhere vanishing function and get another thing, another j or omega that's just as good. So by choosing a normalization, I can get this identity, um, and I'm going to do that in the expressions that follow, and that's actually important. Thank you. OK. So, but this is, this is literally a choice. This doesn't have to be true, but I'm just making a choice of normalization. This j wedge omega is 0 is part of what's required of an SU3 structure. So if I write out um, what dj and d omega can be in general then, in fact, using this, then what I'm going to get is the following. And I'll explain, write it up and then explain what these pieces are. So I'll get one term that looks like that. So dj is a three form, so is omega, so that makes sense. W4 here is going to be a one form. And then W3 is going to be a free form. So that's one expression. And for d omega, we have something vaguely similar. We'll have w1, so the same function that appears here, times j wedge j. That makes sense, because d omega is going to be a four form, and so is j wedge j. Then we'll have a two form, w2 wedge j. And then finally, we'll have there we go. And there's some conditions on these w's, in particular, which are essentially part of what makes this uh, writing unique. Um, we're going to choose uh, w3 wedge j to be w3 wedge omega to be 0. And then we're going to choose w2 wedge j wedge j to be 0 as well. So these w's, every time I get close to the speaker, it's feeding back. So I'm kind of lurking on this side of the board. The wi, where i is 1 to 5, are called torsion classes. And they're used to classify what kind of SU3 structure you have. So um, if you stare at these, you can see how such a split um, can come about. You can either do that by brute force. There's actually one piece missing, Mars bar to the person who can spot what you need to show that this split is unique. But you can just stare at these and see that you can write this in general using forms if you've got enough patience. But if you read the, this more deeply into this uh, SU3 structure literature, you'll find what's happening is you're splitting up dj and d omega 
into pieces that transform in a specific representation under the structure group. Nevertheless, it's just a characterization of how dj and d omega look. And the only slightly weird thing that may puzzle you is w1 appears in, this, you know, in two different places. That's just coming from this constraint. So if you use the fact that j wedge omega equals 0, that implies that that that's true. If you plug both of these in, use this, use that, you'll find that you have to have the same w1 in the two pieces. Okay. So what's the name of the game? If we have a compactification of the heterotic string that's going to preserve n equals 1 supersymmetry in the 4D theory, then this must be true. We must have two such forms that obey this algebraic condition. And depending on what kind of solution of the heterotic string that we get, we look at, we'll get different constraints on these torsion classes that will tell us what kind of SU3 structure we're interested in. And what we're going to do is go through and look at three different cases, three different sets of possible torsion classes that, consider, that correspond to different possible compactifications of the heterotic string that give n equals 1 theories. keep you. No, I'm going to have to use the squeegee. It's no good. So the three cases we're going to look at is, first of all, something called the Strominger system, which is probably the most general thing you're interested in here and I'll explain what it is as we go along. Then we're going to look at a very special case of the Strominger system, which is nice because it's basically the only place where we know any examples. And then finally, we're going to look at something more general than the Strominger system that may be of interest in doing these kinds of compactifications, but which has definite problems associated with it. So we're just going to look at these three cases. And in each case, we're going to look for different types of solutions to those killing spinner equations we had at the start, and the type of solution you have, the type of differential constraint you had from the killing spinner equation, will give you different constraints on these torsion classes, will give you different constraints on the SU3 structure you're looking at. Okay, I'm so slow erasing that it's dried on the other side by the time. That's good. So case one is often called the Strominger system. Um, actually, the, the same system, I believe, was, come up with Hull by, uh, was developed by Hull at the same time. Um, and shamefully, I don't actually have that reference, so I'll look that up for next time. But you can find Strominger's paper in Nuclear Physics B, 274, 1986, page 253. This is a very readable paper. Uh, almost reads like a novel. You can just go through it and see the calculation that he's doing in solving those killing spinner equations. It's not phrased in the language of SU3 structures because that's a sort of a more modern way of talking about things. So if you want to see how this solution to the killing spinner equation gets phrased in terms of SU3 structures, you can find that in Cardoso et al. So it's Cardoso, Curio, Dal Agata, and Lust. Um, and you can find that here. Incidentally, when I give archive numbers, that's not because the paper is not published. It's just because it's easier to find that way. So this is the solution to the killing spinner equation, and this is rephrasing it in terms of these torsion classes. And what are the constraints on these five torsion classes, and what is the Strominger system actually asking? So the question that Strominger asked is, what are the conditions on the SU3 structure to get an n equals 1 theory, as always, but with an n equals 1 maximally symmetric, so anti de sitter de sitter or Minkowski space, 4D vacuum. So he's not just asking the theory preserves supersymmetry. He's asking that in the 4D theory that you get, 
you have a perturbative vacuum that's n equals 1 supersymmetric and uh, has a maximally symmetric space-time metric. Actually, when you solve the equations, if you ask for maximally symmetry, maximal symmetry, it ends up having to be Minkowski. So what are the, the constraints on the SU3 structure? Well, you can just write them down in terms of these torsion classes. That's how everything's classified. So you find that you need W1 equals W2 equals 0. W4 has to be related to W5, and that has to be exact. Uh, that phi actually does in turn out to be the dilaton. And then W3 can be anything. And that will give rise to a solution to the theory. Basically, any W3 you find that corresponds to a certain DJ, which is sort of some kind of curvature or something, and that can be balanced by a choice of flux, appropriate choice of flux. That's a pretty specific set of torsion classes. I started out with these five objects that were sort of general forms of different degree. Two of them have to be zero. The other two, another two have to be related and, and exact. And only one of them is left general. That makes it very difficult to find solutions of this form. And the reason it's difficult is it's kind of easy to write down manifolds that are going to have an SU3 structure. But it's kind of hard to see ahead of time what torsion classes they're going to have. So you kind of write down your manifold of SU3 structure, you work out torsion classes, and you say, were they of this form? And almost every time you do it, you'll find that they're not. So it's actually very hard to find solutions of this type, and there's very few examples known, other than a very special case that we'll come to in a minute. So general examples of this type, here's some examples. Um, So there's a set of examples that co go commonly under the name of the Fu Yao examples. Actually, here I've just been talking about geometry. So these solutions have a geometry, and then they have a gauge field on top of it. So far, I've basically only been talking about geometry. Um, and the Fu Yao examples are actually, the manifolds were actually written down by Goldstein and Pakushkin. Um, and you can find those here. Again, a very readable paper. Oh, the type of solutions these guys looked at, where well, you take a K3 and you fiber two circles over it to get a six manifold. And if you fiber them in the right way, you get an SU3 structure manifold that has torsion classes of this type. And in fact, this gives a two parameter family of such um, solutions. And basically, those two parameters are describing how these circles are fibered over the K3 base. There's a, what Fu and Yao did, um, and Fu and Yao, their paper is, I've got it here somewhere, yeah, HEP TH 0604063. They made sure that there were good solutions for the gauge fields living on top of these manifolds. So this is very nice. You have this solution, two-parameter family, no less, and you have the gauge fields over it. Everything solved nicely. But there's a big problem with this set of solutions. And the big problem is that every single example in this two-parameter family that's non-trivial has small cycles in it. In particular, it has string scale cycles in the manifold. And that's a problem because we were using effective supergravity when we wrote all this down. So mathematically, finding a solution to these equations of this form is very nice. Um, and <coughs> Yao's group has done a wonderful job of, of find, you know, really proving that there's a solution. But for using these as examples, at least in the context of using effective supergravity, there's a big problem in that supergravity probably isn't valid. I also wanted to mention there's some more recent work along similar lines that we just had last week. We had a, a seminar by Teng Fei in Virginia talking about this. So Teng is... Um, one of Yao's students who's now in Columbia as a postdoc. And he and his collaborators, um, and you can find their paper at 1711.08.186, found another set of solutions to this theory. And their title of their paper is An Infinite Number of Solutions to the Strominger System. And they do have an infinite number of solutions. 
what their solutions look like is it's um, T4 or K3 fibers. over a genus G, so some genus uh, Riemann surface, and again it's uh, you know, a real tour de force of solving these equations, making sure everything's well defined and so on and so forth, but again it seems so far, so we were sort of quizzing Tang on it and it's not totally clear, but it seems that it suffers from the same kinds of problems that Fu Yao did. Ooh, I'm running out of time. In particular, it seems that, again, you're going to have small cycles. And in addition, the structure group of the bundle they're using, and we'll come to this in a minute, the, the gauge field VEVs they're using probably don't fit within E8 because they've got a U2 structure group for the bundle and, and the generators of E8 are traceless. Sorry, James, when you say two-parameter family, you mean that the model of K3 are frozen somehow? Or? Sorry, I mean there are two integer parameters um, giving me a family of topo topologies, and then, of course, you have continuous moduli on top of that. That's a great question. So here I'm just talking about families of topologies. So when these guys say they have an infinite family of solutions, they mean they have an infinite set of different topologies, an infinite set of Hodge numbers. That's a uh, really great question. Sorry for not keeping that clear. So this is generally what you probably want. It's really hard to solve. So what are we going to do instead? Well, we're going to do what physicists always do, which is to cheat. We're going to go to a simpler case that we can solve, right? Spherical cow time. So what we're going to do is look at a simpler set of manifolds that also solve the equations where we can use a tool uh, that's going to help us build examples, and that tool is algebraic geometry. So that was case one, probably the case you're interested in. If you uh, ever find a a large set of solutions of those where supergravity is valid, I'm really interested, so let me know. Um, but case two is going to be the case that people commonly talk about, and that's the Club Yao case. And the nice thing about using torsion classes is you can see exactly how special a Club Yao is. So you have a Club Yao if and only if W1 equals W2 equals W3 equals W4 equals W5 equals zero. That's pretty special. You're just going to set it all to zero and make life easier. Now, you can make dodgy physics arguments for why this may be a good thing to do, and we may get to some of that in the fourth lecture, but the real reason we do this is because of the following statement. Club Yao are the only SU3 structure manifolds that are also algebraic varieties. So two things here. First of all, if you talk to mathematicians, they will often talk about Calabiao in a more general way. So often you'll find that mathematicians uh, will talk about anything being a Calabiao that has trivial canonical class, whether it's Kähler or not. <sighs> yeah. Nevertheless, uh, what I'm using physicist convention here, so when I say a Club Yao, I mean the thing with a Rishi flat metric on it. Um, and what this statement is saying is, if you want to use algebraic geometry, so if you want to describe that manifold, that SU3 structure manifold, as the solution to a set of polynomial equations, type of thing you can put on a computer, your only choice is Club Yao. Now, you may be able to cheat, right? Maybe you describe a base with algebraic geometry, fiber something over it, like in the Fu Yao case, and get something else. But if you want to describe the manifold directly as an algebraic variety, your only choice is Club Yao. So how do you see that? So um, we have this form omega. So omega is a nowhere van vanishing... Uh, Three form. And what that means is that your anti canonical bundle, and so your canonical bundle is trivial. So um, the anti canonical bundle is basically three wedge powers of TX dual, of the tangent bundle dual. Um, so it's the thing that, if you take sections of it, gives you three forms. 
It's a line bundle. And if you have a line bundle that has a section that's nowhere vanishing, that means that that line bundle is trivial. So the canonical bundle of an SU3 structure manifold is trivial. So mathematicians call all of these things club yeah, sometimes. And that means that um, C1 of it, the first churn class, a topological property associated to it is zero. And a little bit of algebra says that that implies that C1 of Tx is the same thing, is also zero. But an algebraic variety is by definition Kähler. So uh, an algebraic variety is basically a set of uh, complex sub loci inside projective space. Projective space is Kähler. Any complex sub manifold of a Kähler manifold is also Kähler. So any algebraic variety is Kähler. Algebraic variety is Kähler. So if we want an SU3 structure algebraic variety, it's going to be Kähler with vanishing first churn class. And that's one of the definitions of a club, yeah. That argument is depressingly simple because there seems to be very little way around it. So we use these because we can build large numbers of examples of them. You may have heard of one of them, if you've not worked, even if you've not worked in this field. If you just take P4, complex projective space in four dimensions, and you look at the solution set of a degree 5 polynomial in the homogeneous coordinates, that's the quintic club Yau manifold, that's one example. There are many examples of club Yau, and there are many examples where the supergravity description is valid, and that's why we use these things. How many examples we have, we don't actually know. And the reason for that is, and Lara's going to talk about this more, we have these big data sets of club Yau, but they all have redundancies in them. You may have two different descriptions of the same manifold and not realize it. In addition, um, some of the descriptions we have of these manifolds, like the toric description, can describe several different manifolds at once, and you don't know how many. So we don't really know how many examples of this type we have, but it's clearly over half a billion. So you, you go from having basically nothing to more than you can deal with by making this simplification. And that's basically why we're going to do it. So in my last few minutes, um, let me talk a little bit, just for five seconds, ab about uh, something a bit more general than doing the Strominger system, why it's a bit dodgy, but why you might be interested. So what torsion classes constraints you get depends on what question you ask. And we've seen two questions we've asked and two different sets of torsion classes. If you ask for the most general set of uh, compactifications you can get with a 4D Minkowski space vacuum, we got the Strominger system. If I asked for the most general case where the internal manifold can be described by algebraic geometry, I get a club Yau. But I could ask a different question. I could ask, what is the set of constraints um, to get an n equals 1 theory in 4D with no maximally symmetric n equals 1 vacuum? In particular, for example, I could ask, what are the set of constraints on the torsion classes so I get an n equals 1 theory, but where the vacuum is a BPS domain wall in four dimensions? Now, this may look like a really stupid thing to do, um, because, hey, check it out, Minkowski space, right? But it may actually not be so dumb. And the reason it may not be so dumb is if you look at all of the moduli stabilization scenarios that are used, for example, in type 2 theories, they tend to play off perturbative effects against non-perturbative effects. Now, you may have many problems with that, and you'd be right to do so. But nevertheless, it's something that people try. So here, what you may be interested in is a compactification that gives you um, a theory that perturbatively has no n equals 1 vacuum and has no Minkowski space solution but is such that when you add in non-perturbative effects in the four-dimensional theory and then solve again for the non-perturbative vacuum, the hope is miraculously you somehow then get a Minkowski space vacuum or something near it. And you can ask then, what are the constraints on the torsion classes so you get that first step? A, a theory that's an n equals 1 theory um, with... Uh, with, with uh, no n equals 1 vacuum. And Lucas and Matty worked this out. 
And basically, you get a relaxation of the conditions that you get from Strominger. And that comes from relaxing the fact that you asked before for an n equals 1 vacuum. So for example, only the imaginary parts of w1 and w2 now have to be 0. w4 and w5 remain unchanged. And everything else can be completely general. So a much more general set of manifolds will give rise to this. Yes, I have to stop. You can go even further. So uh, these guys missed out some fluxes. Um, we realized that you could put them back in. And the only thing you actually need to keep is w4 is d phi. And the final thing I'll mention, where I want to stop today, is that actually you can do some very strange things that people thought were wrong when they originally appeared in the literature by following this kind of approach. So one thing you can do is have a kalabi yau compactification with flux on it. And that turns out to be a perfectly good solution to the theory. For years, people thought that wasn't the case. But what you can do is you can arrange for the back reaction of the flux to not change the kalabi yau itself, but to warp the, the four-dimensional space-time and give you a theory that doesn't have an n equals 1 vacuum. So this has all been about manifolds today. These are the possibilities. For the rest of the lectures, we're basically going to home in on the one where we actually know how to do something and talk about kalabi yaus. So the first thing Lara will do tomorrow is talk about the gauge fields that appear over these geometries, talk about bundles. And then we'll go into the geometry of Kalabi manifolds and bundles over them and go from there. OK, thank you. OK, let's take a few quick questions, if there are any. Um, stupid question, but can you repeat this thing about omega used to there? I was lost there. Repeat the thing about which one? Uh, the thing that's in the blackboard there, omega. Oh, yeah. What you were saying there? So what, what this is saying is, um, to have an SU3 structure, you have a nowhere vanishing three form. This three form is a section of the anti-canonical bundle. And what that means is, and it's nowhere vanishing. And what that implies is that the anti-canonical bundle, or by duality equivalently, the canonical bundle, let me do this, the anti-canonical bundle is trivial. The only bundle that has a nowhere vanishing section, only line bundle, is a trivial bundle. The C1 of the trivial bundle is 0. Okay. And it turns out that C1 of a wedge power of a bundle can be related to C1 of a bundle itself. So C1 of the canonical bundle is actually the same as C1 of Tx. So if you have a three form that's nowhere vanishing, you have vanishing first churn class. And the trouble with that is algebraic varieties are Kähler. So if you have Kähler manifold and a vanishing first churn class, then you're club, yeah. Good question. Um, uh, I, su <laughs> I suppose that these case three uh, um, vacua yeah. should somehow be dual to um, uh, no scale vacua of type two B. Is that, so that that's a that's a good question. Probably not no scale because um, they they would be have a Minkowski vacuum, right? Well, but I mean, if you take corrections into account, you would expect them to... Yeah, but these are sort of perturbative. Bit. So you're on the right track, I think. But um, yeah. often what would happen, for example, is one of these no-scale... Well, you've got me doing it now. <laughs> one of these, these vacuoles will be dual, for example, to a case in type 2b that may have an h-flux that causes a domain wall vacuum. Um, and actually, in that paper... Uh, in a different paper I can give you if you send me an email, there's a sort of a triality of cases where they have one of those cases... A case with flux in, uh, that causes a warping in the extra dimensions, and then a non-geometric case, all dual to each other. Yeah. No, good question. Okay,